Nearly 170 years after it was first published, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre remains an intriguing, powerful read. In this video, aimed particularly at A-level pre-U students studying the text, I will explore the secrets and deception within the novel. I will begin by exploring an early accusation of deceit aimed at a ten-year-old Jane and the effect this has on her both in the short and the longer term. I will continue by exploring the deceit practiced on Jane within Thornfield Hall, the fact she is not told about the secret presence of Rochester's wife, Bertha Mason, and scrutinise why the secret is not uncovered in spite of numerous clues and alarmingly violent incidents. I will explore the character of Mr Rochester. What makes him such a successful deceiver and how do we as modern readers react to his behaviour? Analysis of the imagery used to describe Bertha will also provide insight into our feelings about his deceit. As ever with my videos, I will include numerous quotations on screen with page numbers taken from the hardback Everyman edition of the text. These may be particularly useful for pre-U pupils who will need to memorise relevant quotations to use within their closed book examination. Stay tuned, enjoy. Let's explore the secrets and deception within Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. A false accusation about deceit in the early stages of the novel causes fury and prompts behaviour which unsettles conventional parental figure-child dynamics. Ten-year-old Jane Eyre, bullied, isolated and repressed within her aunt's household, is introduced to the supervisor of Lowood, a boarding school for orphan girls. She is particularly inwardly outraged by this request from her aunt. I should be glad if the superintendent and teachers were requested to keep a strict eye on her and, above all, to guard against her worst fault, a tendency to deceit. This false accusation unleashes a passionate side of Jane's character that has hitherto lain dormant. Alone with her aunt, she cries, I am not deceitful. If I were, I should say I loved you, but I declare I do not love you. I dislike you the worst of anybody in the world except John Reed, and this book about the liar you may give to your girl, Georgiana, for it is she who tells lies, and not I. What is striking about Jane's language here is its shocking directness and honesty about something so personal and fundamental to human existence, love within families. Jane reveals her pent-up feelings explicitly and incredibly bluntly, even developing her initial points about her lack of love for her aunt so that the latter is aware of her exact position, second to bottom, within an imaginary league table of hatred. This moment of terrifying lack of deceit haunts Jane's aunt periodically for the rest of her life, so much so that on her deathbed she recalls in wonder how for nine years you could be patient and quiescent under any treatment and in the tenth break out all fire and violence, I can never comprehend. So Mrs Reed's false accusation of deceit is the catalyst for young Jane to finally assert herself as a human being who deserves fair treatment, and she maintains this determination to be respected as a human being, irrespective of her current social status for the rest of the novel. Indeed, it is surely Jane's unshakable sense of her own value, in spite of her lack of friends, in spite of her position as a mere governess, which Rochester finds so attractive later in the novel. But in the short term, Mrs Reed's false accusation causes Jane unnecessary suffering early on in her time at Lowood. She is utterly humiliated by Brocklehurst, 
who has her positioned on a very high stool in front of the entire school so that he can publicly lecture her about her wickedness. He pontificates, my dear children, this is a sad, a melancholy occasion, for it becomes my duty to warn you that this girl, who might be one of God's own lambs, is a little castaway. For, my tongue falters while I tell it, this girl, this child, the native of a Christian land, worse than many a little heathen who says its prayers to Brahma and kneels before Juggernaut, this girl is a liar. Mr. Brocklehurst's language and behaviour exposes the cruelty and hypocrisy that can be unleashed in the name of Christianity. The quotation I give is a severely edited version of a speech which uses every rhetorical device going to build up to its earth-shattering, gasp-inducing climax about Jane's inherently deceitful character. There is the use of conjuries to repetitively highlight Jane's natural, advantageous position as a Christian human being, which is intended to be deflated hyperbolically by the revelation that she is that evil of all the evils, a liar. Brahma and Juggernaut are both references to the Hindu religion, and the implication is that Jane's sins are even worse than those incurred by misguided practitioners of a faith likely to be viewed as considerably inferior to Christianity. Brocklehurst also describes his own reaction to the revelation before telling us what that revelation is, which likewise builds up a sense of anticipatory horror about the supposed crime that Jane has committed. Brocklehurst's language is so theatrical, so intended to hurt, that the reader not only empathises all the more with Jane, whose late exchanges with her aunt implied agreement from the latter that the accusation about deceit was inaccurate, but questions the integrity and human decency of a man who seems to be using Christianity to humiliate and give him a platform on which to perform. Watching the same moment within a movie version of the film, brings home just how young Jane is to be humiliated and put down in this fashion. Here's Zeffirelli's 1996 version, with Anna playing the young heroine. A screenplay of such a long novel would inevitably have to make savage cuts. Nevertheless, this Brocklehurst similarly shows his love of bullying and the sound of his own voice ahead of genuine Christian clarity. The stool. Place this child upon it. You see this? This girl? Her name is Jane Eyre. Be on your guard against her. Avoid her company. Shut her out of your conversations. This girl, take a good look at her. This girl is a liar. Whereas Jane is unfairly castigated for deceit early on in her tenure at Lowood, on arrival at Thornfield, there are early signs and hints that others may be hell-bent on deceiving her about a dark secret permanently present within Rochester's isolated mansion. Initially, these hints take the form of unsatisfactorily explained sounds and curious laughter. On her first full day, Mrs Fairfax gives her a guided tour of Thornfield Hall. Jane writes, The last sound I expected to hear in so still a region, a laugh struck my ear. It was a curious laugh, distinct, formal, mirthless. What was that? Further unexplained, otherworldly laughter is heard prior to Mr. Rochester's bed being set on fire. This was a demonic laugh, low, suppressed and deep. I thought at first the goblin laughter stood at my bedside. These descriptions are packed with adjectives which emphasise just how jarringly out of place the laughter is within the everyday normality of Thornfield Hall, 
On first hearing, the laugh is curious, worryingly mirthless, and the lack of mirth also hints at a possible lack of humanity and human warmth. These adjectives are then developed more specifically to associate the laughter with the devil and evil, with imagery transforming descriptions into innate, diabolical characteristics. So these sounds hint at a dark secret at Thornfield Hall, but the lack of any visual clues means that Jane can be deceived more easily about the laughing creature's identity. During her guided tour, Mrs Fairfax deliberately deceives Jane, albeit following Rochester's implicit or explicit orders, when she suggests that the loud laugh may have come from some of the servants, very likely, perhaps Grace Poole. Jane seizes on this idea and sticks rigidly to it, in spite of increasing evidence throughout the middle of the novel, which suggests Grace Poole may not be this source of apparent malignity after all. But of course it is not just the dearth of visual clues about Bertha Mason, or her over-eager acceptance of the idea of Grace Poole's culpability, which results in Jane failing to personally unravel the secret of Thornfield Hall. Rochester is an intelligent deceiver and utilises his unusual, forthright and domineering position and character to good effect. His intelligence is frequently shown during his reactions to calamities which could easily result in his secret being revealed. In the immediate aftermath to the bed fire incident, Rochester first gets Jane to stay put whilst he goes to check that Bertha has been re-secured. Then, he indirectly interrogates Jane to find out exactly what she herself saw. Finally, he instructs her not to say anything and endorses Jane's self-deceiving interpretation of events, i.e. that Grace Poole must have been responsible. This reveals a man who thinks before acting and speaking, who plans stage by stage his steps and words. As a result, he gains a degree of control over the uncontrollable, the secret presence of a mad lunatic within his household. But Rochester's early exchange with Jane have already shown him to be unconventional in speech and behaviour, thus veiling largely unconvincing verbal responses to danger under the cover of this unusual, eccentric character. Added to the fact that Jane, in her own words, is merely a paid subordinate, then it is hardly surprising that Jane does not uncover the secret of Bertha Mason during her conversations with him, even though Rochester himself hints darkly about past troubles and his feelings about them early on in their relationship. Here is a flavour of some of his extravagant, self-pitying, certainly self-obsessed musings. Fortune has knocked me about. She has even kneaded me with her knuckles and now I flatter myself I am hard and tough as an Indian rubber ball. On the one hand, Rochester's references to the actions of fortune and his subsequent suffering shows a degree of openness about his past, or at least about the effects of his past on his own happiness. The personification suggests that Rochester feels he has been desperately unlucky with what has happened to him, the specifics of which we are not told at this point, and that, like a Shakespearean tragic hero perhaps, he has been left powerless, and crucially, relatively blameless, by the violent, windy blow planted on him by fate. But Rochester's predilection for extravagant, enigmatic, romantic, expressive phrases and imagery, as exemplified by the nonsense just explored about knuckles and Indian rubber balls, means that it, that it is easier for him than, say, a plain-talking buff, to avoid situations in which he would be expected to talk lucidly about worrying, unsatisfactorily explained events such as the fire in his bed or the savaging of Richard Mason. Or put otherwise, it is easier for him to continue deceiving the woman he is growing to love. Zeffirelli's version emphasises Rochester's introspective, brooding nature. He speaks about fortune bitterly with strings bowing in the background to help us sympathise with past unknown tragedies experienced by this intriguing, ugly man. I once had a heart full of tender feelings. But fortune has knocked me about. Now I'm hard and tough as an India rubber ball.
even though Rochester deceives Jane about his first marriage and ensures everyone in the household does likewise, it is clear that he has a conscience and suffers inwardly for his actions. Mrs Fairfax makes reference to this when she suggests to Jane that he may have unelaborated on painful thoughts, no doubt, to harass him and make his spirits unequal. Whilst Rochester himself talks critically and emotively about his inner turmoil when he asks Jane, thus nearly proposing, Is the wandering and sinful but now rest-seeking and repentant man justified in daring the world's opinion in order to attach to him forever this gentle, gracious, genial stranger, thereby securing his own peace of mind and regeneration of life? The rhetorical question format and the tentative use of third person show that Rochester has tortured doubts about the rectitude of pursuing a relationship with Jane while still married to Mad Bertha. He dare not say it, but isn't this question an exploratory semi-attempt to undeceiving Jane about his married status? Daring the world's opinion is surely a reference to 19th century society's conservative beliefs that men and women could only live together properly and enjoy a sexual relationship within the boundaries of marriage? Is Rochester attempting to gauge whether, in principle, Jane can countenance the idea of a man living with a woman as a partner rather than a wife? However, Jane's responses and Rochester's understanding of her character make it clear that she would never embark upon such an unconventional, unchristian, within the 19th century even, route, thus making continued deception vital in order to continue his fantasy of a fulfilling, happy relationship between them. Conscience or no conscience, Rochester can nonetheless be a cruel and manipulative deceiver, resulting in suffering and hurt for both Blanche Ingram and Jane herself. In spite of his later attempted justification that Blanche deserves such treatment, he is surely wrong to get Blanche's hopes up about his intentions for her. With hindsight, Rochester's decision, given his domineering personality, it must surely have been his idea, to set up a charade in which the answer is bride seems particularly shameless. In this charade, Blanche dressed up as a traditional virginal bride, with Rochester as bridegroom. A ceremony followed, in dumb show, in which it was easy to recognise the pantomime of a marriage. There is an unmistakable flirting, unfairly getting Blanche's hopes up a few minutes later, when Rochester declares, well, whatever I am, remember you are my wife. We were married an hour since, in the presence of all these witnesses. The narrator describes Blanche's revealing reaction. She giggled and her, and her colour rose. Readers, particularly, especially modern day ones, may be more likely to spring to Rochester's defence here, both asserting that this behaviour takes place prior to his suspicions being confirmed about Blanche's ruthless mercenary nature and that the quip about Blanche being his wife is nothing more than flirty banter that only a desperate woman would lose any sleep over. Nonetheless, irrespective of Rochester's, Rochester's intentions at this point, the bride charade is incredibly and unnecessarily risque, particularly given that the majority of women in the 19th century without independent means would rely exclusively on securing an appropriate husband for their future financial security. Even if you do have good intentions of marrying a woman, it is surely in bad taste to dress her up as a bride for a cheap in-joke, knowing that you, and you alone, hold all the power when it comes to formalising any relationship. But Rochester is clearly a man who enjoys acting and theatre, a medium in which both actors and audience willfully indulge in self-deception about the reality of what is being presented, whilst also by less enjoyable necessity maintaining his deception about Bertha. He indulges in a double dose of deceit when he disguises himself as a gypsy fortune teller in chapter 19. This causes a great pulse of excitement amongst his guests, but allows him to probe both Blanche about her desire for the Rochester estate rather than the man himself and Jane. Once Rochester has revealed his identity, Jane sums up key reasons for his deceit which relate to her. I believe you have been trying to draw me out, or in. You have been talking nonsense to make me talk nonsense. It is scarcely fair, sir. By draw me out, 
Jane means that Rochester has been using his disguise in an attempt to get her to temporarily shun her carefully controlled, reticent persona and to talk more openly about her feelings, preferably for him. <coughs> but Rochester doesn't just deceive Jane through his physical disguise, but by his enigmatic and also somewhat sardonic to the more astute reader responses, including the one to Jane's question about whether he is to be married. Appearances would warrant that conclusion, and no doubt, though, with an audacity that wants chastising out of you, you seem to question it, they will be a superlatively happy pair. He must love such a handsome, noble, witty, accomplished lady. Successful fortune-telling gypsies are likely to be cautious and vague where possible when predicting the futures of clients. And so this, to some extent, could justify the caginess of Rochester's opening response. Appearances would, would, would warrant that conclusion. But as Jane later implicitly recognises, Rochester may be disguised physically, but he is characteristically far more interested in teasing and delving verbally about matters close to his heart than using the realistic turns of phrase and expressions of a genuine gypsy. So it is Rochester's own sceptical tone that comes across in his dutiful list of Blanche's traditional female qualities and the excessive confidence of statements such as, no doubt, they will be a superlatively happy pair. However, although she does feel that Blanche would be unlikely to make Rochester happy, Jane is too aware of her own penniless situation, plain features and, compared to Blanche Ingram, inferior social class to contemplate the notion that he might somehow prefer to marry her. Rochester knows that his Jane is firmly aware of her position in the world, knows that she is not a jumped up, presumptuous, relentlessly ambitious social climber. It is one of the many reasons he likes her. And so when he, disguised as a gypsy or not, suggests that the marriage between himself and Blanche Ingram is likely to take place, irrespective of his tone of voice or apparently sarcastic phrasing, he must know that Jane is more or less likely to believe him and that such deceit is likely to cause emotional pain. When considering Rochester's culpability for deceiving Jane, it is important to emphasise just how potentially dangerous and violent his secret, Bertha, can be. As implied by the imagery used to reference her laughs, Bertha is capable of frenzied flashes of devilish, out-of-control violence, as her brother re-establishes to his cost. In Chapter 20, Carter the surgeon examines Richard Mason's shoulder and exclaims in horror, The wound was not done with a knife! There have been teeth here! Let's have a gory close-up look at this wound. This time, the clip is taken from the 2006 BBC version directed by Susanna White. There are teeth marks here. She sucked my blood. She said she would drain my heart. I warned you. I told you not to do anything until I could be with you. Flesh biting and blood sucking are associated with vampires rather than human beings. And indeed, when Jane does catch a glimpse of Bertha for the first time, she tells Rochester that she resembled the foul German spectre, the vampire. Whilst we may be inclined to sympathise more with Rochester, because we are regularly brainwashed into viewing his wife as evil, out of control and not fully human, the fact that he decides to expose Jane to such danger without any warning or adequate protection suggests that there may be an unsavoury, egocentric, nar narcissistic side to his character that is too often submerged between convenient perceptions of Byronic masculinity. I've already made reference to the demonic and vampire imagery used to describe Bertha, but let's not forget the imagery of wild beasts. When Jane is methodically mopping the blood from Richard Mason's wounds, waiting for Rochester to return with a surgeon, she hears Bertha, although she still thinks it is Grace Paul, moving around in the next door room. I heard there a snarling, snatching sound, almost like a dog quarrelling. Such alliterative imagery is reinforced when Rochester himself reveals his secret following the collapse of the marriage ceremony. Jane enters Bertha's room and describes her thus. What it was, whether beast or human being, 
one could not at first sight tell. It grovelled seemingly on fours. It snatched and growled like some strange wild animal. Both quotations use similes to dehumanise the mad woman and thus try to justify inhumane 15 year penning up. Verbs such as grovel, snatched, growled, snarling, give an impression of a low-lying, crawling, pent-up, ready-to-spring dog, which, like other dangerous dogs, must surely be kept under lock and key to ensure the safety of normal human beings. But whereas dangerous dogs in farms are generally kept in wide cages through which the beast is clearly visible, Rochester has kept Bertha away, unseen, in a corner of his mansion, quite close to Jane's room, and failed to tell her about her presence. The fact that Rochester's deceit put Jane's life in danger is highlighted by the tearing of the wedding veil incident, which takes place just over 24 hours before the intended marriage ceremony. Fairfax, it was not even Grace Poole. Jane reveals to Rochester, and the reader at the same time through direct speech, that a creature first put on her wedding veil, then took it off, rent it in two parts, and flinging both on the floor, trampled on them. Of course, ripping a veil in half after modding it briefly doesn't physically harm Jane, but it does reveal hatred and opposition to the idea of marriage, which unsettles in its symbolism and disturbs the wanton destruction of something traditionally associated with love and purity. Rochester's reaction to James' narrative, once it has been established that it was not just a dream, shows that he knows just how dangerous his secret hidden wife can be. I felt Mr Rochester start and shudder. He hastily flung his arms around me. Thank God, he exclaimed, that if anything malignant did come near you last night, it was only the veil that was harmed. Oh, to think what might have happened! Rochester doesn't say it directly, but his inference is clear. Jane could have been seriously hurt. Richard Mason's wounds are evidence enough of this, and if so, he himself would have to take the lion's share of responsibility. So how do we react to Rochester the deceiver? Well, as modern readers, our reaction is likely to vary considerably to those browsing the novel back in 1847 due to different attitudes towards mental illness. Wouldn't our own mental attitude and mental state rapidly deteriorate, be kept within a darkened room all day, year after dreary, soul-destroying year? Nowadays we recognise that madness is an illness which requires specific treatment a little more sophisticated than 24 hours each and every day locked away. Yet, it is clear that Rochester feels that he is being comparatively kind to his secret, tucked away wife. It, it transpires that he could have made her situation far worse. He tells Jane that he could have lodged Bertha in Ferndean Mansion, from which Jane is presumably penning this narrative, now married to Rochester and hopefully in reasonable health. Had not a scruple about the unhealthiness of this situation, in the heart of a wood made my conscience recoil from the arrangement. Probably those damp walls would soon have eased me of, of, of her charge. But to each villain his own vice, and mine is not a tendency to indirect assassination, even of what I most hate. So by 19th century standards, perhaps Rochester was comparatively kind to, in his own version, place Bertha in safety and comfort, shelter her degradation with secrecy. Indeed, most of us would feel that his attempt to save her life shows us his fundamental decency, whilst the loss of his sight, temporarily, and a hand, permanently, is sufficient punishment for his deceitful behaviour towards Jane, an attempt at bigamy. In Zephyr Rennie's version, the director chooses to show Rochester's attempt to save Mad Bertha's life, rather than have it narrated by an obscure former household employee. This, of course, makes for excellent dramatic cinema.
Arthur. Arthur. Come across to me. Don't be afraid. Come to me. Please, give me your hand. Bertha, come to me. No. I would never harm you. Don't be afraid. Come to me now. Please. And so the overall message of the book must surely be to celebrate the equal passionate love between a man and a woman, whilst accepting the fact that secrets and deceits are inevitable obstacles for all human beings to overcome, forgive and understand. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare, A-level pre-U revision guide exploring secrets and deception within Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. Many thanks for watching.